Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I would like to remind you that this conference is being recorded. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those connected by telephone requiring operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. Web participants requiring support should use the chat feature on your screen. I would like to now turn the meeting over to your moderator, Jennifer Zelmer, President and CEO at CFHI. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, and thank you to everyone for joining us today for today's webinar, uh, focusing on the settings where older adults live in uh, long-term care, in other congregate living settings, and what are we learning, and how can we act on that learning in terms of uh, the situation in the pandemic together. My name is Jennifer Zelmer. Uh, I am the CEO of the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement, and I'm delighted on behalf of both CFHI and our partners in this initiative, the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, to welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, as we begin, I would like to begin by acknowledging that today, through the wonderful mir miracles of virtual technology, uh, we are able to join together from many, many different parts of the country, lands that have been walked on by Indigenous people since the beginning. I'm joining you today from Ottawa, the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. And as I've been learning about the traditions in this territory, one of them is absolutely a tradition of convening, of meeting, of gathering, and of sharing and exchanging uh, knowledge in, in a variety of different ways. And while on a webinar like this, there's many advantages. One of them is that not everybody will have an opportunity to speak today, but we encourage you to participate in this conversation through the chat box throughout the webinar. Please feel free to introduce yourself now so that others know who's on the line. And at any point during the call, uh, ask questions, pop comments in there. If you have other resources that you think would be useful, please help, this to make, uh, please help us to make this an all teach, all learn session today. Si vous voulez participer en français, veuillez désactiver les autres parleurs de votre ordinateur et composer le numéro sur l'écran. Thanks again and welcome. So in today's webinar, I am pleased to introduce you to uh, my colleagues who will be joining in today's discussion. Um, my partner in crime, Tanya McDonald, Program Director here at CFHI, and also uh, Mario Di Carlo, who has worn many hats over the course of a storied career. He's held management and senior management positions in, since the 1980s in roles focused on customer service and sales and for many years has served on a variety of not-for-profit boards. Uh, in uh, 2007, he became involved at the uh, McGill University Health Center as a facilitator for their great chronic disease self-management program and has played a key role in spreading this initiative across Quebec. He's also on the MUHC's Patients Committee and involved with their patient engagement initiative and so happy to have you joining us today, Mario. And uh, as well, uh, Marianne Darpino, Senior Director of Patient Safety, Improvement and Capability Building at CPSI, uh, also wears many hats and has had a variety of uh, career experiences, including a background as a nurse, primarily in the long-term care and community health sectors. So Marianne brings lots of important perspectives to today's conversation. Uh, speaking of today's conversation, there's three things that we're hoping to do today. Uh, we're excited to share with you, and you would have gotten a sneak peek in the executive summary that was sent out to those who registered for the webinar by email, of uh, a series of interviews um, that we conducted over the last few weeks on care for older adults during the pandemic, including identifying a number of promising practices. Uh, to give you a heads up in terms of upcoming joint programming uh, focused on how do we scale and spread uh, these promising practices to really focus on opportunities to reduce the risk of a second wave in the, of the pandemic in these settings and mitigate its effects if it does occur. And last but not least, equip you to become with the information that you'll need to participate in the program. As we do that, though, it's super important for us to set the context and absolutely essential that the first voice uh, that you hear in terms of the substance of today's conversation, not just me doing the intros and setting things up, is Mario's. So Mario DiCarlo, patient partner extraordinaire, can I turn it over to you? Thank you very much, Jennifer. Can you hear me well? Absolutely. Okay. Well, um, I'm uh, delighted to be uh, part of this uh, meeting today. Um, 
My name is Mario DiCarlo. I'm a patient partner. Uh, I was affected by polio uh, many years ago uh, during the, uh, the epidemic of the 1950s that uh, extended to the 1960s. Uh, as a child, a one-year-old, I was, uh, you know, um, touched by polio, and uh, I've been living with uh, weaknesses and paralysis uh, all of my life. Um, and uh, recently, uh, my father was affected by COVID-19 in uh, the month of uh, April. And uh, now we're talking about a pandemic versus uh, the epidemics of the earlier years. And uh, he lost his life through this disease. And uh, it was a um, quite an ordeal uh, living with all of these emotions. Uh, uh, during the month of April, not being able to see my father uh, prior to that because the access to the long-term care residences uh, here in Quebec uh, was completely shut down. Um, and uh, my father had a little bit of dementia and communication was awful. Uh, not being able to get proper updates, um, communicating uh, with the staff or my father was, uh, was, was an ordeal. Uh, thankfully, I was able to see him in his last moment. Um, uh, that was uh, another uh, set of circumstances where uh, I was able to be there uh, for the last uh, few hours, and uh, uh, my wife was allowed to be uh, present with me exceptionally. Uh, and uh, the set of rules that kept changing you know, um, how many minutes I could stay with my father, or how many hours, or, and uh, one nurse had told us, you know, that we can stay as long as we wanted in the room, and even remove our masks and our gloves, uh, and, uh, you know, touch my father, and so on. So, very conflicting information. So, this brings me to the work of, that PFHI is doing, and and for me, it's uh, it's super super important to have this the consistency of information, uh, being able to provide some guidelines, that, uh, some reference points for everybody, you know, all stakeholders, uh, because at the end of the day, it's an experience that touches all of us, whether we're at the uh, professional end or at the receiving end as as patients. We all, uh, you know, communicate, and we need to uh, to support each other. Uh, I believe very strongly that I can contribute uh, to support uh, the, the professionals with lived experiences and uh, a set of eyes that can, uh, that can contribute, that can be helpful for everybody. And at the same time, of course, as patients, we, uh, we depend so much on, uh, on the administrators uh, as well as, of course, the clinicians first and foremost uh, that, uh, you know, that are there and present with us. So we, we, we have this interdependency, the symbiotic uh, you know, reality that uh, we cannot uh, put aside. And uh, when I heard about this project uh, from Tania uh, just uh, recently, I was very excited to, to see that PFHI is taking a leadership in this. And they're, they're, do, they're doing it right. You know, they're, they're involving uh, all the stakeholders possible to, to think through all of the different dimensions of uh, the issue that is uh, touching us more than ever, uh, especially in long-term care. So um, I, when, when she talked to me about it, of course, I wanted to be present with you today and, um, and share uh, a little bit of my experience, but also uh, to continue learning and uh, possibly contribute in the future because we're not out of the woods. This is going to be going on for a little while. Um, and uh, we need to hold hands and, uh, and continue uh, partnering uh, with uh, everyone around the table. So uh, thank you for having me, uh, Jennifer, and, uh, and uh, you know, I'm listening with both ears today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mario, and uh, we're listening with both ears to you as well, and thank you for sharing your experiences both previously and during the pandemic, because it is, to your point, that lived experience that is so important in, in helping us to move forward. And I know 
uh, Marianne, that that's a perspective you share as well on that importance. Can I turn things over to you? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be joining the call today um, and to be partnering on such an important initiative. I'll just do a quick um, sound check to make sure I'm coming through okay. You're good. Great. Um, and especially thank you, Mario, for sharing your experiences and highlighting these very real um, unintended consequences that we're, see we're seeing and that occur when we move families and caregivers further away from their loved ones um, when they're needed most, which has undoubtedly been during these vulnerable situations for residents living in long-term care and retirement homes. And, and we know that when residents don't have their family members or caregivers close by to both advocate and provide the extra support that they may need, um, the risks to resident safety are, are too great. Um, so maybe I'll just, um, next slide uh, please, Tanya, thank you so much. So what I thought I would do is um, just spend um, a few minutes talking about what we have learned from a safety perspective during the pandemic and then share some core concepts that guide patient safety um, that you can look forward to as you start to learn more about the programming and it unfolds. Um, so I know that when I say these are truly unprecedented times, that this completely resonates with all of us. It is still a time with much uncertainty, but what we do have is the luxury of knowledge and experience from all levels of the healthcare system and the people who work in it to begin to make sense out of what has happened and prepare for a stronger and more resilient future together. Um, so no doubt this year, 2020, has marked a new age for health quality and patient safety in Canada and around the world. Um, your quality and safety national bodies have come together to respond, support, and learn from all of you and help build that stronger system that adapts to the needs of residents and families. Um, the pandemic presented Canada with several challenges that made it clear that the healthcare landscape in Canada and around the world is not and will no longer be the same. Recognizing this evolving landscape, safety has certainly become the new buzzword and exchange in almost every interaction and conversation. So looking back through a safety lens and listening intently, this is what, this is what we heard. Because the healthcare world as we knew it has dramatically changed, we must consider how we adapt our thinking and new approaches to safety in Canada and globally. We don't want to create unnecessary burden, strain, or any distraction to an incredibly overwhelmed system. We need to consider the safety implications and needs of all sectors as they come together in this new world order. And these are three main insights and learnings I wanted to share with you today. The first is we need to protect Canada's most vulnerable populations. And while there are many vulnerable populations, certainly the protection of residents is paramount. An example as we turn our attention here Current accommodation, structures within long-term care and residential housing increase multiple risks and, and disable the ability to contain and manage outbreaks. We need better strategies and infrastructure to protect residents of, of care homes. In addition, physical distancing and the use of PPEs is difficult for people who have physical limitations regarding hearing, vision, as well as cognitive impairment due to various diagnoses. Secondly, we need to prioritize healthcare workforce safety. Healthcare worker safety is linked to patients and public safety. A growing and important concern for all ministries is the type and level of support given to healthcare workers. Communication and collaboration is key. Timely information, data, and transparency build public trust and resilience systems. We need improved information and communication across and within Canadian jurisdictions about safety implications. Effective communication is needed at the bedside as well, and most importantly, ongoing, open, honest, regular discussions with families are needed about status of their loved ones, how to stay safe and visiting a loved one with or without COVID. Patients and the public need to be engaged at all levels, and clear and consistent um, and ongoing communication is needed between governments and service delivery organizations. 
So we need to remove those barriers as well to using health IT information technology to improve safety, developing tools and resources that will help keep um, themselves and their loved ones safe as we continue to adapt to virtual care spaces. Next slide, Tanya. I'm not seeing it pop up on my end, but maybe it's just, um, maybe my system just slow to catch up. Yeah, it's up for me, Marianne. You're good. Okay, perfect. So as we focused on what we were learning through our various networks, and specifically around the incredible knowledge and early insights that CFHI was able to glean um, through various expert advisory groups, it reinforced the need to continue to apply the core concepts of patient safety. So we know that these concepts, when applied, care is safer and outcomes are improved. CFHI and CPSI have a long and strong history of partnering with patients and families to deliver resources that are truly co-designed. CFHI recently discussed this situation of resident family partnered care with a rapid response advisory group, um, and you'll be able to, to read a lot more about that in the report um, that will be referenced. However, the advisory group identified um, several next steps for reintegration of family caregivers as partners in care during the pandemic. Another concept is teamwork and communication. Over the past decade, it has been identified that providing evidence-based practices to healthcare teams is not enough to improve patient safety. Instead, there needs to be a shift, a focus on how to improve team skills such as communication and teamwork thereby improving patient safety culture and patient outcomes. <clears throat> By focusing on improving teamwork, communication, and patient safety culture, we will truly raise the patient safety bar. Managing risks and incidents. When organizations have a systematic way of learning when things go sideways or when errors occur and use them as opportunities for improvement, that is a major win for patient safety and organizational culture. When leaders can set the tempo for a transparent organizational culture where both staff and residents and families can speak up when they sense something is wrong, that type of culture enables a sense of inquiry and curiosity aiming for better quality and safer care. So when healthcare teams work within these environments, they be can begin to recognize the presence of safety. Next slide, Tanya. So I will just say um, in closing that patient safety is more important than ever before, and the Canadian Patient Safety Institute and the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement are leading the efforts to emphasize quality and safety as the cornerstone in healthcare. We're working to equip and encourage every person on a healthcare journey to identify patient safety, celebrate it, and share all successes. So as you begin to learn more about the programming, um, you can be sure that, we, that these core safety competencies will be integrated throughout. Um, and I certainly look forward to learning, uh, to being on this learning journey with all of you. So on that note, um, I will pass it back over to you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marianne. Really appreciate that overview of the safety implications and also opportunities and, and ways of thinking about the situation and, and grounding our conversation today. Um, as we move into the next part of today's webinar, um, I'd like to start sharing with you some of the results of the interviews that we did. So we spoke with um, about 40 people across the country um, some with lived experience um, in, in this current pandemic environment, like Mario. Um, some who had different types of experience, uh, leading hospitals, leading long-term care organizations, uh, leading retirement homes, or indeed in public health as well. So a variety of perspectives. And we asked them about three things. We asked them about what contributed to the outbreaks that we've seen. What promising practices have they seen? What areas, because we know the situation hasn't been the same for everyone, so where do we have lessons learned that we should start to look at going forward? And last but not least, many, probably most people living in long-term care retirement homes 
have a variety of other health issues. And so how are we looking at maintaining essential non-COVID care for older adults through 2020 and beyond? So uh, you should have seen by email the executive summary. It's also available on our website today. And the full report um, will be available next week. So you're getting a bit of an advanced preview today. So some of the context of what we heard. Um, we certainly heard that much of the work on initial preparedness focused on hospitals. And so that meant that uh, most of the focus on personal protective equipment supply and infection prevention control um, wasn't evenly shared across the health system. We did hear that in areas where there was a strong regional focus, and that could be through a regional health authority or it could be through other mechanisms that brought regional stakeholders together, that that really helped to coordinate both resource allocation and response. Um, we also heard that there was uneven reporting and testing, particularly in the early days of the outbreak, and that long-term care homes that were overwhelmed seemed to follow a relatively consistent pattern to reach that tipping point. We also saw that for homes in full outbreak, a major team response was required, particularly in situations where uh, many of the staff leaders within those teams actually had tested positive themselves and so we're not able to respond in the same way as they would have otherwise. We heard in some of those interviews about a number of grim realities during the pandemic, but we also heard about some things that seem to be working really well. So to give you some examples, they're grouped into these six clusters that you see on the screen. Um, there were a number of promising practices that were identified in terms of preparation. So making sure that there was updated infection prevention and control training, um, that there were active meetings. So we heard, for instance, in some communities how uh, public health, long-term care, hospitals, um, paramedics, and others have actually gotten together and done tabletop simulation exercises to walk through. So if this happens, what will you do? If the other thing happens, what will you do? So they'd worked out a collective response in advance and knew how that response would play out. The second category of promising practice we heard about were in terms of prevention. Now, most obviously, possibly in terms of testing and contact tracing and having those mechanisms set up being robust and reliable. Also, in terms of universal map, masking and uh, infection, uh, control, uh, infection prevention and control precautions. But also in terms of intense home and community support that in some communities made sure that people were able to receive care closer to home and community rather than having to be admitted to long-term care or staying in hospital, so that they were in an environment at lower risk. So for instance, uh, children who were supported with uh, home ventilation services or expansions of home dialysis, other types of supports that allowed people to get the care that they needed. Um, the third category, people because there's absolutely no question that people, we can talk about supplies and facilities and all those matter, but people are at the core of pandemic preparation and response. And so we heard about a number of promising practices in terms of opportunities to stabilize staffing and working conditions, for instance. Um, some jurisdictions moved quite early, many have moved subsequently to ensure that staff were only working in one higher risk environment. And we're supported to be able to do that um, in that context. Also to look at things like um, increasing capability, whether that was training or recruitment, particularly making sure if people were coming in from outside as part of surge capacity, that they had the training and competencies and skills to be able to be really effective in this current situation. And as Marianne mentioned in some of her comments, also looking at psychological health and safety for health professionals and how do we best support that. Uh, the next cluster of responses that we heard from were, were, were in terms of response capacity and surge capacity. And you know, one of the things that we heard over and over again is one of the most important things is to know who you need to call if you do have an outbreak. Who can you reach out to? What will their response be? Um, if you do need that help, and what surge capacity is available to you. 
We also heard about other opportunities in terms of reducing the risk of nosocomial infection and some really creative approaches that had been used within different settings um, that we all have the potential to learn from as we go forward. I've mentioned briefly already uh, COVID and non-COVID care. And you know, as we talked to many people who were interviewed, they said you know, non-COVID care just couldn't be a priority in the early days of the pandemic. But we know that we need to be thinking longer term. And we need to be thinking about how to support residents' needs for care that's not just COVID related, but they may be related to their heart or neurological condition or other types of health problems. Some of the promising practices we heard about were about stabilizing clinical leadership and ensuring there was backup. Particularly in um, some settings, there may have been a part-time medical director. If that person was away on holidays or got sick, the backup may not have been in place. So having those arrangements in place and structured from the beginning. Ensuring that every resident has an individualized care plan that's been updated for these circumstances that takes into account how they will receive care for all of their various needs over this period. Uh, equally, we heard about a number of settings that brought in and strengthened relationships with primary health care locally and how that really helped them to be able to support residents in this time. And last but certainly not least, in fact, it's last on this list because it's a segue to what's happening next in terms of the programming, is looking at the presence of essential family caregivers. Ensuring that there's an opportunity to revisit policies. Understandably, at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, the doors slammed shut because of the concerns about infection control. Now there's an opportunity to revisit those policies with resident and family uh, partners at the table and be able to look at what's possible going forward. What are the opportunities for approaches that take into account principles of harm reduction, that take into account principles of how do we support individuals and their needs in a variety of ways that work for them in their context and in the context of the pandemic that's underway at the moment. So that just gives you a quick taste of some of the promising practices that we heard about. The intention with the new programming that we're talking about today is looking at opportunities to share those promising practices in both long-term care and other congregate living settings. And, and be able to continue to build on those as well. So for instance, uh, coming up, we'll, we've got a webinar planned on family presence in long-term care, building both on what we heard from the interviews, from uh, those with lived experience, from those working in the sector, also the work that Marianne mentioned from the Rapid Response Task Force that we convened, and work by the National Institutes of Aging that's come out recently as well. So bringing together a number of those threads to look at this question about how do we revisit, and uh, as Mario said, look at the consistency of the approaches that we're using as well. So there'll be a series of, of virtual learning opportunities uh, coming up. At second, we hope to support the sector to prepare for future waves of COVID-19 and beyond, of course, because these preparations can apply in a number of different settings, using approaches that are based on a learning health system model that build on data, practice, emerging knowledge, and really take advantage of the all teach, all learn possibilities in terms of opportunities for connecting and knowledge sharing. So with that, it's my pleasure to hand over to my colleague, Tanya, to uh, talk us through some of the specifics about what's coming next. Tanya, over to you. So thank you, Jennifer. So yes, yeah, so just also to highlight that in addition to the work that we're doing specifically in long-term care with this uh, new program offering that we will be sharing on the next slide, there are also other programs that are currently happening within CFHR that can also uh, help support the sector as we uh, continue uh, to plan and prepare uh, for uh, the future uh, and for uh, future uh, potential waves. So we have our Priority Health Innovation Challenge that supports both home and community care uh, teams um, adopt innovations in their uh, respective settings. And we also have uh, different programming that are happening currently in long-term care uh, around embedding new models of care. So we have our paramedics and palliative care program, as well as embedding a palliative approach to care in the long-term care sector. Our connected medicine uh, program that connects um, 
family physicians to specialists in uh, their own uh, family care uh, practices to help give those connections with a real focus on uh, resident and patient uh, care, and also our appropriate use of antipsychotics work uh, that is uh, also happening in the long-term care sector and continues to happen in certain provinces across the country. So in addition to our um, general program offerings that have currently been happening over the past months and years, we're also uh, set to launch a new program program offering. And really what this uh, program is, is to help support homes in the sector uh, based on their needs and where they, they are at. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned, uh, we have identified some promising practices as part of our interviews that we've been conducting since the month of May. Um, and really, uh, we want to be able to share those practices and help teams working in the sector rapidly adopt any promising practices that may help them further uh, plan and prepare for the future. Um, we know that you've been diligently working uh, in this area since March. Uh, planning, preparing, uh, preventing, and managing outbreaks, um, and therefore we really wanted to offer a program that was flexible, that could meet you where you are at in terms of your uh, needs, uh, your improvement needs, um, and really make sure that we're in alignment with work that you're already doing in your provinces as you prepare for the future. So in terms of our Long-Term Care Plus acting on pandemic learning together, we have several program offerings that are available to homes that are interested uh, to help meet their improvement needs. So we have created a self-assessment to help identify future improvements as you prepare uh, for future waves of uh, COVID-19, as well as uh, other improvement opportunities related to outbreaks. We recognize that many of you probably already have a tool or an assessment that you're using, uh, but we just wanted to uh, share one that we've created based on the promising practices that we found in our report that will be published next week. We also want to help uh, support the rapid adoption of some of those promising practices so to meet those improvement goals. And there are different ways that we are uh, planning on helping you rapidly adopt uh, those innovations or promising practices. Uh, so we are offering, as Jennifer mentioned, the virtual learning series with the first uh, webinar happening on August 10th, and the focus will be on family presence in long-term care. We're also offering uh, some national long-term care huddles and leveraging some of the work that we've been doing already in the appropriate use of antipsychotics, uh, where we have conversations with people, uh, with uh, system leaders and um, providers uh, with a focus on appropriate use of antipsychotics. We're planning to replicate the similar model uh, with a focus on long-term care and the promising practices identified in the report. We also have coaching and mentoring that is available to homes and teams who want to rapidly adopt uh, these promising practices and just need a little bit of additional support uh, from, P from coaches and mentors who are experienced in quality improvement. Um, through these virtual learning series and also these national long-term care huddles, there will be opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer exchange. Um, and we're also uh, collecting some tools to help support the change, as well as there is a potential for seed funding uh, for some homes uh, that uh, may need it on a, as it becomes available. Um, and also, um, a policy lab uh, will wrap up the entire programming with a focus on family presence and long-term care. So in terms of the timeline for this, uh, this menu of program offerings, so as today is the launch, so uh, that we're shared the executive summary of the report and also presenting the different options that are available to homes who would like to uh, focus on uh, a more uh, specific area of preparedness uh, for the fall. Uh, through August and January, we'll be offering a monthly virtual learning series. And as Jennifer mentioned, the August 10th will focus on family presence. Um, and also on July 27th, so next Monday, we will be sharing the full report uh, of what we heard across uh, all the interviews that have been happening since May. Uh, we will also be sharing the self-assessment tool uh, for uh, use um, for homes who want to sort of go through a bit of a checklist of what, uh, what we've heard and where they're at and whether there are areas for improvement. 
um, and then uh, also um, access to coaching and support for the rapid adoption of uh, those promising practices based on their self-assessment and uh, the potential for access to seed funding as it becomes available based on uh, a completed self-assessment. And in the fall uh, winter, we're hoping to, uh, as I mentioned, have a more uh, focused discussion on family presence through a policy lab that we will be um, hosting here at CFHI. And so how can you participate? So really, uh, the objective of this program is to really make it accessible and flexible uh, so that um, homes and teams can come in where they see a need for them, where it meets, aligns with their uh, improvement objectives. So as I mentioned, next week we will be uh, launching or publishing the report, uh, and we will also be hosting a webinar uh, to discuss the findings in that report. We will be making the self-assessment tool available for homes who wish to um, enhance their improvement efforts, and they can uh, read through the, um, the self-assessment form, identify areas for improvement, and then uh, submit a request for access to coach, to coaching and mentorship to help them meet their improvement goals um, and potentially some seed funding. Uh, and then, of course, we're offering a virtual learning series with uh, one uh, every month focused on those six areas that Jennifer spoke of in the beginning with August 10th focusing on family presence. And as you can see, these virtual learning series will run until January. And so as I mentioned before, if you feel you might need some additional support to, to rapidly adopt some of these promising practices that we've identified, there is a potential opportunity for coaching and seed funding. Um, and this will be uh, based on the self-assessments, uh, the completed self-assessments that we will receive uh, as part of this program offering. And so if you have any questions, if you're ready to go, if you want more information, uh, we have an email address here uh, that will uh, be directly uh, sent to uh, the team here at CFHI who will be responsible for uh, connecting you to the different program offerings and providing more information uh, depending on where you're at and what your needs are. So please do not hesitate to reach out to, uh, to us and we'll be happy. Uh, to uh, respond and offer our assistance and some resources and some direction on what to do next. So now I will pass it back over uh, to Jennifer for the question and answer period. So if you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat box and we'd be happy uh, to respond. Thanks so much, Tanya. And uh, thanks to everyone who's joining us today. Feel free to type questions in and maybe as you're doing that, there was a couple of comments that came up earlier in the cycle in the chat. Um, so maybe we can start with those. And I know, Mario, you responded to one um, that had been describing the importance of family presence in this current context. I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to add to your comments in the chat box. Um. Could we ask uh, Joanna maybe if she wants to click that? Uh, pardon me? Sorry, could you repeat that? Should we ask Joanna if she wanted to expand on her comments first? Uh, sadly, um, only the four of us actually have the opportunity to speak. So uh, okay. there's only so many mute buttons we can press all at once <laughs> to make a conference call with hundreds of people work. So uh, yeah. Joanne, feel free to add things in the chat box, but, uh, yeah. but uh, we, are, we do have some technical limitations. Yeah, I, I, I agree uh, wholeheartedly with Joanna's uh, comments. Uh, obviously, there are so many aspects uh, to all of this. Uh, she mentioned the idea of the culture um, and, uh, you know, it, it, just the, 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 the whole approach. I think that uh, there's been a lot of learning. Uh, you know, we, we can highlight all the, the missteps and so on, uh, but uh, there, is, there has been a lot of learning. And I think uh, going through this and, uh, you know, potentially uh, facing a second wave and so on and so forth, uh, we can certainly get um, uh, get ready. And, uh, and and I think that what we're doing right now will help tremendously to get uh, to get everything aligned uh, for the future uh, because this is going to be for a while. So, yeah, I, I agree with uh, the comments on the... Uh, the you know the policy changes and um, getting everybody involved. Uh, um, you know one thing that uh, really really affected uh, my family was the fact that uh, we were not able to be uh, present with my father and 
he had some psychosis uh, episodes and so on. And uh, we weren't able to be uh, present and receive information in a timely fashion. And also being able to interpret. Uh, my father didn't speak the official languages very well. And that added to tremendously to the stress. And um, in Canada, this is a reality. There are many people, uh, as they get older, uh, they lose touch with uh, their uh, their newly acquired language that they revert to their um, mother tongue. And uh, that is a further handicap in the communication. Um, so there are many, many aspects. And I, in going through the report, uh, I, I saw that the, you touched on many of these, uh, these elements. And uh, I think that adding everybody's voice and uh, just fine-tuning it and uh, research other people's reality will be uh, super important as we go forward. Thanks so much, Mario. You know, a, a number of years ago now, a colleague said to me at the time, when I'm sick, I'm not bilingual. And, you know, I, I, that is a reality for so many people and absolutely one of the important things we need to consider, as well as, um, you know, the, the challenges I I too have relatives who live in long-term care and they have good days and they have not so good days. And it depends on what the day is like. Absolutely. Hopefully we can continue to build on, on that good work on the upcoming webinar and beyond as we do this work together. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, looking at a couple of the other, I'm trying to keep track of the questions as they're coming in. A um, couple of the other recent questions that came in were around um, some of the recommendations that may be available for in specific areas. So communication, supplies, and so on. And uh, absolutely, you may have seen, in fact, there's some uh, new interim guidance from the federal government that's just come out. We will also be referring to a number of uh, standards that have been developed to try and make those easily accessible. You know, it's, I actually, if I could, if I was brave enough, I'd pull it up. A friend of mine actually just embroidered for me a little embroidery hoop that says, add value, not noise. Um, because I think right now in the middle of the pandemic, there's so much going on. Um, and one of the things we hope to do through this process is make it easier to find the news you can use, the information that's relevant right here, right now. Um, to be able to uh, move forward in, in areas like those. Um, there's also a question about um, linkages with Accreditation Canada and HSO. And Tanya, I know you've had some conversations. Do you want to take that one? I'm trying to locate the mute button. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we've had discussions. Uh, so thank you, Patricia. Uh, we've had discussions with uh, Kay Phillips uh, at HSO um, about how we can uh, leverage uh, the the standards and the new long-term care resources that are currently being created. Uh, so absolutely, once our assessment tool is, um, or I, I guess it's more of an assessment checklist because we're looking at it, you know, we're always thinking about practical from an improvement perspective, but uh, we will be definitely making those links because uh, as mentioned previously, it's, it's important for us to not, as Jennifer said, not add noise. We know that many organizations have many different levers that they're already using to plan and prepare, and uh, this one was really based on um, what we found in our report, so we will definitely make those links to make sure that uh, uh, they're streamlined and that we're uh, taking advantage of all the levers that we have out there in order to make this work possible. Thanks, Tanya. Um, so in terms of uh, other comments that have come in, uh, thanks, Sarah, for your comment in terms of looking forward to um, new approaches, differing approaches to change management and, and supporting teams given the quick nature of the change. Uh, we are too, and in fact we're experimenting with a number of different approaches uh, through this process. As Tanya said, trying to make it as flexible as possible, recognizing that you know the situation is very different in different parts of the country and also just depending on whether people are on holidays over the summer or not, there's a number of just practicalities. So we are trying to make it as flexible as we can moving forward. And we would really welcome your feedback and suggestions uh, as we move. You know, this, this is a new process. And we've been using the analogy internally that it's building the road as you're walking on it. 
Um, and so we hope that you'll join with us in walking that road together. And part of that is making sure that we get your feedback in terms of what's working well, even better if, so that we can continue to adapt as we go. I really appreciated your comment, Cindy, about um, the fact that New Brunswick so far has been blessed with no long-term care outbreaks. And you know, so important to recognize that the situation is just not the same in different parts of the country. Um, and that one of the big factors, as we heard often in our interviews, was actually the level of community spread that existed in a particular community, and therefore um, the risk that a particular home may have experienced or may not have experienced. So, um, you know, many people said to us uh, when we were doing the interviews, you know, I, I actually, my home wasn't affected in the first wave. And part of that, we hope, was good management. And here's the things that we did to support that. But part of it may also have been good luck, because we were in a community that had less community spread. So we, too, want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to reduce the risk of a future outbreak or mitigate its effect if it does occur. Um, so I think that's a super important point, Cindy, about how we can all join together. Uh, Patty, thanks so much for your comments. Um, lots of levers indeed. And you know, I think it's going to be an interesting balance. As, as Tanya described, there's some um, sort of longer term programming that we've been engaged with and will continue to engage with that does involve policy changes. So for instance, uh, looking at opportunities for paramedics to provide palliative care in the home and possibly extending that to long term care. Uh, but also some very practical things that uh, we heard can be done in the short term um, that can make a difference before the fall. So we're really looking for that uh, combination of programming that reflects across that. The new programming will be on that quite practical basis. So you can run down the list in the self-assessment and say, OK, already done that, already working on that. Mm, this one, not so applicable for me in my situation. This one, ooh, that's the one I want to continue to work on. Here's where I can use some help. So you can really get very practical in terms of that approach. Anything else you wanted to say on that front, Tanya, and that balance? I think that's exactly right. Uh, this is We're trying to make it easy for people to implement rapidly um, where they see gaps right now as they prepare. And so absolutely, uh, there's value in the short term and what we're doing, but also thinking long term as as homes uh, need to continue to focus on this in the long term. So absolutely, it, it's all complementary and aligned with uh, work that, are, that, that is already ongoing in the system. Thanks. And, and thanks for Joanna for your comment about the fact that you know there are some issues that existed before the pandemic and we can't lose track of them. There needs to be important work um, that we continue to do in areas like person-centered care and the appropriate use of antipsychotics. Um, and that needs to be able to continue. So there's absolutely a longer term trajectory on that front as well. Um, Anita, to your question in terms of whether uh, public health, mental, medical health officers were included in the discussions and decisions, absolutely. Um, so we spoke to a number of folks in public health, both as part of these interviews, but also as part of the earlier family presence work that um, Marianne mentioned and that uh, Maria put the link into the chat. So we are trying to bring all those perspectives together because that's actually one of the things that we heard was most important from the folks that we spoke with is it's really hard to manage an outbreak or even to plan for an outbreak on your own. You really do need to have those the public health expertise at the table, the infection prevention control expertise at the table, the plan for surge capacity should something happen, and so on. So how can we all bring them together? Uh, Jez, thanks so much for your comment. Looking forward to working with you, too. Thank you so much. Looking forward to diving in together. Um, so Lisa. Um, it's a really interesting question. Um, I would say in the interviews that we did, we didn't hear so much that people were worried about uh, legal implications. They were very much worried about the ethical implications um, and the risk 
um, both to residents and to staff, but also to visitors coming in, and whether people coming into the home, if there was an active outbreak, might be exposed as part of that outbreak as well. So we heard concerns on a number of fronts, and I think that's where, when we did the earlier family presence work, one of the key um, next steps that the Rapid Response Advisory Group recommended was to really look at a, at a balanced view, to understand where were the harm reduction opportunities across, and to understand that um, the longer restrictions go on, that there are risks of harm from that as well as Mario so eloquently described. Um, okay, keeping on going. Um, so Kathleen, yeah, important questions in terms of visiting. So I hope you'll join in our webinar so we can continue the conversation on that topic. Um, those of you who are interested in this topic, you may also be interested in a very recently published uh, randomized trial from the Netherlands um, that looked at uh, introducing uh, family presence into long-term care in a sample of long-term care homes and compared that to long-term care homes where uh, family presence wasn't introduced. And as a result of that trial, they've actually expanded family presence nationwide. So there's some interesting new research evidence as well that come forward. Uh, thanks also for the question about private sector. So everyone is welcome to participate. So uh, public sector, private sector, not-for-profit, regardless of how you get your money and where it goes, um, if you are providing this type of care, we hope that you will take part and both uh, benefit from the promising practices and share your experiences with others as we move forward. Um, Yep, good point, Patty, in terms of residents and families involved in completing self-assessments. We always encourage um, that sort of what we call shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder approach. These days, virtually, that's maybe the wrong analogy. We'll have to come up with a new analogy that works, I don't know, screen-to-screen -screen or something um, that works in terms of that uh, direct engagement, but absolutely. Um, so we're... Coming up towards the end, we can probably fit in a couple more questions. Um, but as we do, Tanya, is there anything you wanted to add in terms of the questions that are coming through? More questions on the Accreditation Canada resources, for example. Although, Patty, you may just want to respond to that in the chat. That may be easiest. It's great, actually. I love it when we get comments back and forth between participants in the webinar. Um, it's always a good sign. Uh, Marianne, there's been a number of, sorry, go ahead, Tanya. Oh, you're on mute. Local versus on local. Mute. Pardon? Oh. Now you're off mute. You're good. Go ahead. Oh, OK. Um, I thought I left. <laughs> so yeah, so we saw a question come in from Claire uh, with respect to the changes versus national, provincial, and local. And we are engaging uh, at all levels, uh, really, actually, to make sure this is a collective effort uh, towards improvement. Um, and so those conversations are happening at all levels. And uh, we're inclusive uh, of everyone uh, participating. And we're also making sure that there's alignment with what the, is currently happening in the provinces, because we want to make sure that we're adding value uh, to what is currently happening so that we can complement and help accelerate some of those improvements. And so the need, I think we're, we are having conversations at all levels, but really focused on supporting those homes who need to rapidly uh, improve or adjust some practices, uh, but also aware that there is alignment happening also provincially. Thanks, Tanya. Marianne, there's been a number of comments in the chat related to safety. Anything you wanted to add? Jennifer, I, I think I would just add, you know, just looking at sort of the theme that's coming across is really, it continues to point to culture. And so, you know, we really do recognize um, collectively that it is about, it, it is the importance of building that organizational culture and working on all of the principles that we've talked about. I think we also, you know, we, we know that long-term care homes um, needed to make certain decisions in the early days and needed to react um, and make those decisions with the best available knowledge that they had. Um, but now is a time for learning and doing better. And so when we know better, we do better. And so, um, you know, looking forward to learning, as I said earlier, with everybody else in terms of how to create that transparent organizational culture 
um, that we know can exist in long-term care. Thanks, Marianne. Mario, I wanted to come back to you as well. There's been lots of comments in terms of resident and family partnership in the chat. Anything you wanted to add at this point? Uh, yeah, in terms of uh, uh, patients um, or families being um, more active, uh, either in terms of direct care or also in terms of uh, helping guide the, the organization, the residents, uh, you know, you know, you know, you have the the residence committees uh, across the country. Uh, Quebec functions a little bit differently, but there are uh, family members and patients on these committees. And uh, for instance, uh, the one where my father was, um, I was on the residence committee, and uh, it kind of shut down for a while. And uh, we were able to revive it, but um, the communication is difficult to get everybody involved. Um, you know, it's like we're working in silos as a residence committee versus working with the uh, the administration more directly in uh, in designing uh, programs and designing approaches and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's not necessarily very fluid, and I think that there's an opportunity right there uh, to activate uh, these groups that are readily available, really, uh, and. Uh, there are many tools that we can use uh, to enter into communication with uh, everyone. Thanks so much. So with that, uh, I'm conscious that our, our time is running down in terms of today's webinar, but there's a, a few additional comments that have come through in the chat and uh, really appreciate um, those that have been added and, and suggested along the way. And uh, I'm desperately trying to scroll my scroll bar. There we go. Thank you for typing in the Netherlands report. Much appreciated. Thank you also for the additional information in terms of um, what's happening with uh, Accreditation Canada and HSO, as well as some of the other approaches that have been used across the country in terms of best practices. Um, so super helpful from that point of view. Um, and I think uh, what I would encourage you to do if you're interested in continuing this conversation, if you're interested in joining in, maybe we can just back up the slides to the one where we've got the email address. Um, so if you're interested in following up, please do just flip us a quick email. We'll be doing the uh, official uh, release of the full report and uh, the other materials next week. And uh, if you send us an email, we'll make sure that you're part of that process and in on the ground floor as we go forward. And as always, if you do have other ideas, suggestions, comments, please do let us know. And uh, I also, uh, as we close today, wanted to take a couple of minutes just to really thank everyone, both those who have worked so hard over so many years to make sure that we're in a better place today to address the pandemic than we would otherwise have been, but also those who've leapt in, um, whether it's uh, individuals in long-term care, whether it's family members, whether it's others. This has been such a tough time, and so really wanted to um, appreciate the efforts that you're making and your commitment to making care better. That's why you're here on the call today. Um, so I hope that you'll join with us as part of this process as we go forward. And we do, I think, have one quick polling question to come up for you as we leave the webinar to help start with that uh, learning opportunity. So we've got the, the launch webinar next week, the opportunity to follow up with us by email, and then that the opportunity to continue this dialogue as well. Thanks so much, everyone. Merci beaucoup.